When many think of 17th century colonization, most of the time, it's viewed as a one-way fight that usually ends with a European power militarily dominating whoever their opponent might be. Largely, this is a correct statement, but a few countries remain the exception to this colonial rule. It is important that we remember those countries and people that managed to free themselves from the shackles of colonization. Most countries would have just been happy enough to kick out their colonizer from their own land. However, in this particular case, the formerly colonized started to take the fight directly to their colonial oppressor. The two countries in question are, of course, Oman and their former colonizer, Portugal. The following story is one of unification, liberation, and piracy, albeit very justifiable piracy. The leader who is capable of these feats was named Imam Sultan bin Saif, the second ruler of the Yoruba dynasty of Oman. Sultan bin Saif's story starts sometime in the early decades of the 17th century. We have no idea when exactly he was born, but we do know at least who his father was. His father's name was Saif bin Malik bin Belarab al Yoruba, the uncle of Nasir bin Murshid, who, in 1624, was elected as the ruler of Oman and the first Imam of the Yoruba dynasty. When Sultan bin Saif was born, this would make him the cousin of Imam Nasir bin Mushid. Unfortunately, we have no idea who his mother was or how Sultan bin Saif spent his early life until 1649. In this year, Imam Nasir bin Mushid would pass away. His succession would be determined and subject to the same voting council that had unanimously elected him the Imam. The voting council would convene at Rustak, same as it had when they had elected Nasir as their Imam. There wasn't a clear-cut answer with who would succeed Imam Nasir, for a few different reasons. For one, Nasir had no children of his own, and even if he did, this meant very little to the voting council. The Ibadi rulers of Amman were selected, not by blood, but by merit. While Imam Nasir bin Murshid was being buried at the city of Nizwa, the Rustak council was voting on who should succeed him. Just like Nasir's election, this vote would also be unanimous. Sultan bin Saif was selected as the second Imam of the Yoruba dynasty of Oman on April 14th of 1649. His first year as Imam would be a period of preparation. Preparation to conclude what his predecessor had started. The removal of Portuguese influence from the Omani coastline was Sultan bin Saif's first priority. Imam Nasir's campaigns against Portugal had seen the reclamation of all of Oman. All of Oman, except for the port city of Muscat whose forts held firm every time that Nasir attempted to take back the city. The Portuguese navy, which at this point was one of the best in the whole world, always enabled for a steady supply of weaponry and food to flow into Muscat, even if one of the forts there was under siege. The city of Muscat was held by three impressive Portuguese fortresses. On the left side of the port was Al-Jalali Fortress, and on the right side of Muscat's port was Al-Marani Fortress. In between these two fortresses, Positioned on a steep hill was the fortress of Mutra. These three primely positioned forts were all connected by one thing, the ocean. Imam Sultan began to challenge Portuguese dominance over the Indian Ocean and Persian Gulf by ordering for the construction of a much larger fleet than had previously been seen under Nasir bin Mushid. With this fleet being constructed and his army assembling, Imam Sultan had only to wait until he could unify Oman and complete his cousin's lifelong work. By November 1649, the same year that he was elected Imam, Sultan bin Saif put the largest Portuguese fort in the area under siege, that of course being Mutra. This fortress had long been a thorn in Imam Nasir bin Mushid's side. He could never take it. Yet again, he wasn't his cousin. Two accounts separate on how exactly, but both state that Mutra was taken from Portugal in a sneak attack. One account says that a small number of soldiers did a nighttime attack and managed to storm the gates, while the other account says that a group of Omani soldiers snuck into Mutra dressed as peasants and hiding weapons under carts of vegetables. No matter the case, Mutra fell to Imam Sultan bin Saif. On the 28th of January, after a blockade and siege of both Fort Al-Jalali and Fort Al-Mirani, the Portuguese finally surrendered and returned all of Oman back to the local populace. And under a year, 
Imam Sultan bin Saif had completed the lifelong mission of his cousin. With no clear direction on where to focus his attention to now, Imam Sultan began looking for ideas. He didn't have to look very far. Sitting in the harbor of Fort Mutra was two top-of-the-line Portuguese warships. With his own navy now sitting next to his two new additions, a plan started to storm the mind of Imam Sultan. It was time to take the fight to where it hurt the Portuguese the most, the ocean. The pirate Imam of Oman was now set loose on the Indian Ocean. For the Portuguese sailing there, the next 30 years of his reign would be one spent in fear. Taking the fight to his colonial oppressor, Imam Sultan began intercepting Portuguese trading vessels. The ships that the Omani navy did not sink, they added to their own fleet. The Omani navy was already filled with experienced sailors and warriors, but now the fleet was slowly modernizing itself, at least up to Portuguese standards at that time. The Portuguese trading outposts and colonies near Oman were located in India and in East Africa. The largest and most prosperous of these colonial possessions was Bombay, a chain of seven islands just off the west coast of India. Today, this area is the second most populated city in India and a center of trade and business. In 1650, there was not much of a difference. In 1655, after five years of preying on Portuguese shipping in the West Indian Ocean, the Imam began to grow bold. With his navy now comparable to any Portuguese fleet, his confidence grew. It was time to not only face their former colonizers at sea, but also to attack them over those seas and directly into the Portuguese colonies themselves. In 1655, Sultan bin Saif ordered for a raid to be carried out on Portuguese-controlled Bombay. With his fleet blockading the Portuguese navy, Sultan bin Saif raided one of the more lightly defended seven islands of Bombay. After a short battle, the Portuguese on this island surrendered, as the Omani fleet rained cannon fire on them. The Omani quickly filled their boats with all the Portuguese treasure and supplies on the island. The Omani navy then made a safe withdrawal and returned to Imam Sultan, ships filled to the brim with Portuguese goods. The fear of the pirate Imam now extended to every Portuguese port in the West Indian Ocean. This, however, was just the beginning of the Omani raids. Before his next coastal raid, the pirate ruler returned to intercepting the Portuguese at sea for another five years. Then, in 1661, the Omani fleet arrived in India, blockading the Portuguese seven islands of Bombay, this time choosing a different island to raid. The Omani marines carried out a swift raid and left nearly as soon as they came. For Portugal, this was nothing short of an embarrassment. Seeing that the defense of these seven islands costed more than it was worth, the Portuguese king just got rid of them. When King Charles II of England married the daughter of King John IV of Portugal, King John gave the Seven Islands of Bombay, even the recently raided one, to the British Empire. Imam Sultan had lost an easy enemy target, although he did help in removing more Portuguese influence around the Indian Ocean. The Omani Imam would need to find a new target. His gaze shifted slightly to the west. On the coast of West India, not far from Bombay, was a Portuguese trading fort of Du. On three separate occasions, the Omani navy raided the outpost with varying levels of success. One in 1668, another in 1670, and a final raid in 1676. However, the most ambitious plan put forth by Imam Sultan was nowhere near India. Sometime in the mid-1650s, a man from Africa arrived in Muscat. He sought out for the Imam, knowing of his naval strength and willingness to fight the Portuguese, he presented Sultan an offer. At this time, the Portuguese Empire held colonies all along the east coast of Africa. This man, who was from modern Kenya, offered the coastal city of Mombasa to the Imam, and all he had to do was kick the Portuguese out. In 1657, Imam Sultan bin Saif sent a navy and an army south towards Mombasa. Not only was the Imam a liberator, but he was now also colonizing his former colonizer. The Portuguese fort at Mombasa was no easy capture for the Imanis. The Omani navy managed to successfully blockade the port, but still they could not crack through the Portuguese defenses on land. The Portuguese were now cut off from their supply ships, resorted to living off the coastal African land. This stalemate lasted for a total of five years, until finally the Portuguese surrendered in 1662. 
Mombasa, which was one of the greatest cities in East Africa and one of the crown jewels of the Portuguese Empire, was now part of the growing Omani Empire. The riches of Mombasa were then taken back to Oman, while an Omani governor was installed to manage this far-from-home city, along with a strong garrison. Shortly after the fleet of the Imam left, Mombasa came under siege again. This time, it was the Portuguese, who now attacked the combined forces of the local Mombasans and the Omanis. Their colonial subjects were starting something of a coalition. Portugal's response would be brutal. What took the Omanis five years only took the Portuguese a few months to besiege and take Mombasa. The Omani governor and garrison inside were killed or enslaved, and colonial rule was re-established harshly. Oman was forced to leave, but soon enough, they would return. By 1676, after a raid on the Portuguese Indian city of Du, all land raids under Imam Sultan concluded, and the Imam returned to pirating the Portuguese shipping in the West Indian Ocean. The wealth brought into Oman by Imam Sultan's piracy was a boon on the local economy. The piracy also enabled for the protection of Omani traders, who ventured as far as Indonesia. With this newfound prosperity, the Imam pumped a lot of that money straight back into Oman. He ordered for the construction of an underground plumbing system in his capital of Nizwa. Also in Nizwa, he ordered for the construction of a huge round defensive tower that took a total of 12 years to build. The Imam was also devoted to the protection of his citizens, with just laws and a strong central government to enforce those laws. Imam Sultan bin Saif was so loved and felt so protected in Oman that he would frequently walk in public with no bodyguards at his side. The Imam set his focus to more public works until his death in 1679, although sources will go back and forth on his exact death date. He would be succeeded not by a voting council, but directly by his son, Bil Arab bin Sultan. The life of Sultan bin Saif was surely an exciting one, and a unique one. In 30 years of reign, he managed to unify all of Oman, and put fear into any Portuguese that found themselves in or near the West Indian Ocean. The pirate Imam was buried next to his cousin, Imam Nasir bin Mushid, at the city of Nizwa.